okay? Yes. Okay, great. So eventually I'm going to write a book on this. It's going to be called The Place Called Death. But one of the secrets in spiritual warfare is understanding how to embrace the place called death. Because keep in mind, one of the number one attacks that the enemy is going to bring against you is to try to kill. The Bible says the three th main things he does was steal, kill, and destroy, right? So yeah. most folks are already stealing from you anyway, if you're not putting your foot down. But when you come head to head with, with the enemy and you're doing deliverance and you're you know, literally working against his kingdom, he's going to try to bring death, okay? Where there's, they're literally going to go to their altars and try to bury you, which means literally try to put you in a coffin. They're going to try to put your prayer life in a coffin. They're going to try to put you in a coffin. They're going to try to put your ministry in a coffin. Um, so there's literally, you're going to be, have to come face to face with a death attack. But this is why we have to understand how to embrace the place called death. Most people... Uh -huh. So most people think that death is a, a, a thing or a, a, a thing that happens to you, but death is actually a place. That's why it's the 23rd Psalm says, yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of this place called death, I will fear no evil. Why? For God is with me. And then it says his rod and his staff, his rod and his staff, they come for me. So a lot of times what's going to happen, first of all, in order for in order for a curse to land, remember, there has to be something in common with you and the devil. So a lot of times when you're going through that warfare and the enemy's coming against you and he's put a lot of death around you, but let's say he notices that the curses are not landing, then what he's going to do next is cause the people around you, the weakest links, the people that are around you, um, to begin to do crazy things so that they can offend you. Because the minute you get offended, a curse will land. Okay? And, and and just realistically speaking, it's inevitable. At some point, a curse is going to land. But this is why we have to understand the power of the place called death. So when that curse lands, what's, hap what's going to happen is immediately you will go under God's judgment. So now that you're under God's judgment, everything in your life is going to shift and it's going to look like the enemy is winning. Because you're under the judgment of God because you went into some type of offense or something and it caused a curse to land. But this is why it says, Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? I will fear no evil, for thy rod and thy staff is with me. So when you're under judgment, this is you have to run into repentance because this is the this is what the rod means, right? You know the scripture that says, Fear the rod and spoil the child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you get under that judgment, you have to run to the rod and allow God to chastise you. If you don't do that, you will die in the battle. So you run into repentance and then run into the place called death, which means you repent, you kill your flesh, and you go further. You go further and head to head with death itself. You can't turn around and try to run away from it. And the more you try to run away from it, the more you lose, especially while you're still in that place of judgment. So what do I mean by that? So you when say you're, repent first. Huh? What you say? You say repent first. Yes, repent. So because once you notice a person's landed, that means there's something in your life mm -hmm. that just caused it to land. So you're going to go straight into repentance and mm -hmm. allow the rod of God to chastise you. So yeah, though you walk through that valley of the shadow of death, you won't have to fear no evil because his rod and his staff should be a comfort to you. So we have to understand that God's judgment and chastisement should be a comfort to us sometimes it's not comforting right nobody likes to be chastised <laughs> but it has to become a comfort to you because it's right after that text that it says uh yeah that walked the battle of the shadow of death i will find no evil without with me i run and aside they come for me and then he prepares the table before you right in the presence of your enemies then he anoints your head with oil until you embrace this place you can't even get an anointing and he can't even prepare the table before you so, but let's go back to this. So let's say you're surrounded by the enemy. There's all these attacks around you. They've buried everything about your life. And now you're literally faced with death and you don't know how to conquer it. So now you run into this place. You begin to repent. You begin to repent. And then you take your keys, the keys that you have for the kingdom. And you walk into death. You walk into that valley of the shadow. You don't go the opposite way, but you run into it. 
because what's going to happen is when you run into it, then it will allow everything in you to die. But you will come out on the other side with resurrection power. That's what people don't understand about embracing the place called death. Because Jesus, this is the reason why Jesus spent three days in the belly of the earth. This is a this is a strategy that most people don't even use in warfare. There was a reason why he spent three days in the belly of the earth. He defeated death, hell, and the grave for a reason. Because that means when I'm confronted with death, I don't have to run away from it. I can take my keys and run into death. And when I run Ooh. into death, I will come out on the other side with resurrection power and look death square in the face and say, oh, death, where is I? You're staying. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Oh, amen. Yes. Thank you. Because if Jesus already conquered it, then you can go right through it, too. And you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Y'all want to understand the 23rd Psalm in a whole other way when you go back and read it. I am I walk, and I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you yay so much. I walk through the valley. When you go into warfare, you're going to be walking through a valley. Through the, through the valley of the shadow of this place called death, I won't fear any evil. Why? Because I know his rod and his staff, they comfort me. So even if something tries to land, I'll just run to his rod and let it chastise me. And I will run straight into death and let it kill every part of my flesh. Because I know if I die, I will come out on the other side with resurrection power the same way that Jesus did. Because if he conquered it, then I, I don't have to be afraid of it. We already have victory over death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? And the same things that the enemy tried to bury in that coffin will come right back up with resurrection power. But so many people are afraid that they run away from death instead of continuing through the valley. And allowing the rod to chastise me. Wow, thank you so much. Any minister or anybody in the gospel, if you will learn and understand this place called death, you will win every battle. Even if it looks like you lost for a, for a minute. Because see, it looked like Jesus, it, it looked like they had won, right? When Jesus, when they killed Jesus, oh, the demons were rejoicing. It looked like they had won. And not only that, but that's it. If the enemy is coming against you with death and you start running towards death, you can confuse the enemy. They're going to be like, hold up, wait a minute. They're going to think that you're conceding. <laughs> They're going to be confused. But they don't understand that you're running in with your keys. Jesus went to hell, defeated hell, death, and the grave, and then brought back the keys. I says, here you go. There's a reason why he got it from down there. But that's a whole nother revelation. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. But yeah, so those are the two main things. Making sure you have a foundation of consistency and you have that place where, where it's kind of like your altar before God. And then also learning how to embrace the place called death. And never be afraid of that place. And never be afraid to allow God to chastise you and to repent quickly. You are recording this, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. I am. So, yeah, that's going to be a book, too, by the way. It's going to be a, a called A Place Called Death at some point. I have so many books to write. I have at least 12 books um, that I still have to write after I finish um, the deliverance one that I'm writing now. But that one right there, so many battles. Ooh, that's so that's many powerful. Battles. That's Some, sometimes you have yeah. to allow it. Sometimes you got to allow the enemy to think you're dead. Sometimes you have to run into it when he tries to bring death. Because if you do that, he will, he will be confused. He won't even know what to do. Just think about it. Mm -hmm. If his number one weapon is death, right? <laughs> He's bringing it to you and you start running towards it. What is he going to do? What's he going to do? He's going to be confused. He'll be like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. This, I wasn't expecting that. It's not worth it. Is she running towards the, the, main, the same thing I sent to destroy her with? Amen. Yeah, you've taken his power away. What he think he has power over you, you've taken it away. But that's what Jesus already did. That's what we have to understand. That's why you can look death in the face and say, oh, death, where is your state? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Because Jesus already defeated it. 
and he gave us power over it when he gave us those keys. So that's one of the things that we don't even utilize our keys for. With the keys that you have, you can go into death and come out with resurrection power because Jesus did it. And he was the first of the begotten of the sons. And you are a son of God. We're sons of God. If Jesus did it, we did it. Everything he did any greater. It is a powerful place. It is a powerful place that Jesus was able to come back with all the power and authority. Do you know how much of your stuff that the enemy has stolen from you that he's buried somewhere? And until you actually go all the way through this place called death, you can't even receive all of it. Like we have to really understand the 23rd town. <laughs> yeah, do I walk through this valley? At the shadow of this place called death, I'm not going to fear any evil. Because, Father, I know that you're rotting your staff down to me. And now that I've done it, now you can prepare this table before me and do it in the presence of my enemies. Now you can anoint my head with a whip and my cup will run over. Abundance comes, anointing comes after you walk through the place called death. So That's you can can you explain how that how how to do that? Um, is it just individually when you go through when the enemy you know attacks you, or is there a way that you can actually you know yeah if you can conquer that um, if you can initiate if I could just dare say that if you can initiate you know trying to get through the shot uh, through the um, you know, that place before the enemy tries to get you to it, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, I don't think that's necessary. The only time you want to walk into it is if that's what you're confronted with. That, that. Yeah, if that's what you're confronted with, which more, more than likely you will be if you're in, if you're doing any type of deliverance. Well, one thing that this um, that um, the author mentioned uh, in the book and in the second book is her covenant with God, you know, and like you mentioned, it's like the enemy tries to kill your covenant with God. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that is something that we can expect. If we have a covenant with God, it's like it's I mean, it's a sure thing that he's going to come against us. Oh, yeah, that's what I was saying. Whenever you're going into battle against the enemy, he's going to come against your foundation. The foundation is going to be the altar that keeps your covenant with God in place. That's what your foundation is. That's why that foundation has to be a wise man builds his house on the rock. And that rock is Jesus Christ. If you don't have a foundation on him, it will get shaken. And if it gets shaken and that's it is on sand and it's not on a rock, he will be destroyed. That's the reason why I think what was it? Jesus was saying to the man of God, he was like, I'm going to pray for you because the enemy desires to sift you as wheat. He'll shake his whole foundation into nothing. That's why Jesus said, I'm praying for you. That your faith will not fail you. So it, it's, it goes so much, there's so many more layers to it too. When you, especially when you read the 23rd Psalm, there's so many more layers. The rod and the staff, they come from me. Look, there's two things there. It's not just the rod. So it's not just the rod of, of running into repentance and allowing God to chastise you with the rod, but there's also the staff. They both have to come for you. Do y'all remember the staff? Who remembers the staff? Who remembers who had a staff in the Bible? Well, Moses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember, he had a staff. Okay, and then who, what? What were a couple of what were some of the things that you saw that they did with the staff? There was some. There was some cool things. There was one when he was going into tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And remember the magician's came and they threw down their staffs and it turned into serpents, remember? Yeah, so he parted the water. 
And then he made water come out of a rock. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, with that. And it wasn't that the same staff that he held up um, when the Red Sea parted. Yes. Okay. So the rod and the staff. Do you know what the staff represented? Who thinks they can guess what the staff represented? What was it that he held up in that staff that caused the Red Sea part? You just said it that long ago. It's the covenant. Oh, okay. So the staff represented the covenant that he had with God. Yep. But his staff was different from all the other staffs. Because remember, the magicians had staffs too, didn't they? Didn't they throw theirs down and they turn into serpents too? Yes. So what did their staff represent? Covenant with the enemy. So they had a covenant with something else. Because whatever God they had a covenant with was what made their, their staff turn into serpents. And the God that was the most powerful swallowed up the rest of the other covenants, right? His covenant was greater than their covenants. That's why the serpent from his staff swallowed up the rest of them. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you go into battle, it's going to be your covenant versus their covenant. Especially when you're dealing with strategic attacks, with when you're dealing with like a whole alliance that's trying to work against you. Um, yeah, it's their covenant versus your covenant. That's the reason why when David saw Goliath, he wasn't afraid because he was like, I know my covenant. He was like, dude, you're not even circumcised. I'm going to cut your head off because he knew the covenant. <laughs> and he knew Goliath didn't have a covenant with God. It was covenant against covenant. And in warfare, it's always covenant against covenant. I don't care if it's as big as a Goliath or not. It's covenant against covenant. So if you don't have a covenant, you won't think. And to have a covenant, your altar has to be in place. That's why the Bible says the fire on the altar shouldn't go out. Because if it goes out, well, <laughs> don't go into war while it's out, that's all. Power of the covenant is determined by the condition of the altar. Does that make sense? You said the power of the covenant mm -hmm. is determined mm -hmm. by the condition of the altar. Yes. Somebody need to uh, write that down. The power of the covenant that you're standing on is determined by the condition of the altar. Because it's always going to be altar against altar when you go into battle with the kingdoms of the world. This is school of deliverance, so you have to know these things. It's not just going there and talking about, oh, come out with the name of Jesus. Because keep in mind, when you speak to a demon and command it to come out in the name of Jesus, that demon is looking at you square in the eye and knows exactly who you are. And you just got on the hit list in hell. We have to know that. This is not a game. The minute you look a demon in the face and command it to come out, the Bible says that's how the kingdom of God is established. When the demons are cast out, the kingdom of God is established. You you just got your name on the hit list in hell. We got to stop buttering stuff up and let people know straight up what you're getting into. Know that your name just went on the hit list in hell when you did that. And that demon ran back and reported. 
that you cast out. That's why you have to have the foundation. You gotta have that foundation built on the rock. If it's built on the sand, they coming back. If they come back, yeah, it's not gonna be no joke. So, but yeah. So, and and a lot of the things, you know, even with the book that we're reading, and he came to set the captive free. I think you guys could see that it's it wasn't it wasn't a ball game like. There was some real stuff that they were dealing with. There was some real powers that were trying to take them out. You know, I think something happens when we go into warfare. It's even like, you know how sometimes people will go to like to actual war. And I think sometimes which I think um somebody was interviewing like one of the soldiers that went, I don't know if it was the Vietnam War or whatever war. And they said, you know, when they went to war. At first, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, they, you go through the basic training or whatever, and it's, you're excited, you know, because, oh, I'm going into war. It's like, it's not until somebody shoots at you that you realize, hold up, wait a minute, somebody's trying to kill me. It's for real. <laughs> and something happens, what if it would have hit you? Like, wait a minute, this ain't no joke. Like, they, they really try to kill me here. <laughs> And then it's like something shifts on the inside of you where you got to go into war mode. But we have to know that, you know. I know when we watch some of these TV shows and even YouTube and stuff, they try to make it make it look so easy. Oh, the demon's talking. Come out in the name of Jesus. And da, 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 da. The demon's saying all this dumb stuff and all this. Um, and we don't understand the ramifications of what you're really getting into. You're, this is kingdoms against kingdom it's not even about you yeah god might be using your mouth to cast the demon out but it's the bad the battle itself is so much bigger than you it is kingdom against kingdom and when you speak in the authority of jesus christ and you command a demon that was in charge of a certain jurisdiction or that demon that was assigned to a certain place or witchcraft, or something that was assigned to an entity that was assigned to a certain place, and you remove it from where it had a stronghold in, you just started a war. And you have to know that. Not as simple as it looks. Because you just took territory for the kingdom of God. And that's another reason why we can't do it um, as a one-man show either. You got to have some support. And make sure you know some people who have actually gone through the warfare and have done deliverance. Because there's going to be some things that the enemy attacks you with that you're not even going to know what it is. Even with discernment. Because there are just so many different tactics and strategies things that they're they're always they're going to be using you have to be led by the holy spirit y'all remember in the book there were like certain things that they were doing that they had to literally be led by the holy spirit so no if they weren't led by the holy spirit do you think they would have survived when the satanists were like trying to get them to kill them and all that no 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 because they were literally trying to kill him, trying to sacrifice him at the next Black Sabbath. I mean, was, even about food, even about her not eating and she's hungry and she had to listen to the Holy Spirit. They poisoned her food. It's not a joke. Like, they'd really be trying to take you out. One thing that I that I heard her say um, in an interview was that initially she thought that she would be totally shielded because she's working for God's kingdom. So in her, you know, naive little understanding, she thought that the enemy was going to be shooting blanks 
And then uh-huh. when she went through this, she realized, oh, no. Exactly. That That's another myth that we have in the body of Christ. I think we think that just because we're in the kingdom of God and they're in the kingdoms of the world, that the enemy's going to shoot blanks and God is not going to let anything hit. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. If that was the case, it wouldn't say many other afflictions of the righteous. Because in that case, nothing should be able to afflict you. Right? I mean, definitely, if it was if it was the way that we imagined it to be, where, oh, God just causes every bullet to fall to the ground and nothing to ever touch you, and you just walking in the bubble, if that was the case, then no affliction should be able to touch you. Why would that be afflictions of the righteous? And and we will see that in the um, New Testament, <laughs> but the disciples didn't experience that. They experienced all this hardship and persecution. So, oh yeah, if Jesus went through it, I don't know what makes us think we don't have to go through it. And it's not a cakewalk. You know, it looks easy when you're walking in the authority of Jesus Christ, and you're just saying it at that moment. That's great. But make sure you're ready at 2 o'clock in the morning when that entity shows up. Because they're mad because you just removed their boy from his jurisdiction and you cast him out. Just saying. I just want you guys to go in with the right mindset. You know, it's not a ball game. It's not a joke. There is literally a hit list in hell. I told you guys about the dream that I had, right? No. I had this dream years ago, back when I was a wedding planner, where Patience Lean Studios, the logo that I have now, I still had that logo, but I was doing events, weddings and cakes and stuff. And I had a dream, and I saw the devil pacing up and down in front of, it was like this thing that almost looked like a bus stop. You know how sometimes the bus stops will have like a big sign on the wall inside of it? And he's pacing up and down in front of it. And on the wall, I see all of these ministries. Like basically all of these, you know, you know, like Juanita the Bynum, Benny Hinn, all these different ministries, like hundreds, thousands of ministries all listed up on this wall. And I could tell he was pacing up and down trying to figure out how he was going to destroy them. Like he was like, because he was frustrated because we're frustrating his kingdom. So he was pacing up and down trying to figure out how am I going to destroy these ministries. And I look, as I'm looking at it, I'm trying to figure out, well, why am I even, you know, looking at this? And the Lord says, well, look at the bottom left of the wall. And I looked at the bottom left of the wall and I saw my logo. It was on the wall. And at the time, it was like, what? I'm a wedding planner. What am I doing on that wall? <laughs> Because at the time, I wasn't doing any of this. I mean, I was, you know, still doing ministry here and there, but it wasn't like, I wasn't doing any deliverance or anything. I was just focused on doing my business and doing the weddings and stuff. But I was, there is actually a wall. It was a wall where he literally had, there was, there was some preachers on there. There were some saints on there that don't even have ministries, but I guess they were like powerful intercessors. Their names were on there. You literally are on a hit list in hell. It's real. And that was the first time I knew, wait, there was actually a list. And it wasn't like, oh, it was like a couple of demons trying to figure out how to get rid of these ministries. It was the devil himself facing up and down. With that revelation. Like it says, going to a fro, seeking, you know, who you make it out. But he was literally facing up and down trying to figure out how was he going to destroy these ministries. And these people who were, you know, some of them weren't even ministries. They were just like individual people, who were prayer warriors, people who were impactful. Some of them were businesses too. That were on that list. Kingdom businesses.
and that's another thing that I don't think I've talked about. I probably need to do a video on that. So why? That's that's nothing. Like why were there even businesses on that list, right? When you think about it, it's like it's just a business. How is it a threat to the enemy's kingdom? Your business is a threat to the enemy's kingdom because you know that money is going to go into the kingdom. Because a part of warfare is, I mean, think about it. Any type of war, when a, when a nation is going to war against another nation, there's three main things. Destroy the communications. Keep right in the form to continue on I-85 business loop north. US 29. Off. Follow signs for after State 85 north. So it's usually three main things. You're going to destroy the communication. That's why sometimes the first thing that anyone will come against is your prayer life. Destroy the communication that they have. So that either they destroy the communication line, which is basically your prayer life and your dreams. So God is not able to speak to you through your dreams. And also, so you're not able to hear God clearly for the instructions. So they destroy the communication. Um, the next thing they come after, besides just the communication, is hold up, I think I just lost my train of thought. What was I saying before this? The the devil comes after your dream, your prayer life. Before that, your dreams. Your dreams? You said a part of warfare. Okay. The business. Okay, I was talking about businesses. And why the your business will be on there. So the, the first thing that come after is gonna be the communications. That's usually the first thing the enemy will destroy. Like if you if you guys have ever seen like war movies, right? They would they would like sneak in in the middle of the night, nobody sees them. They will come in, they will cut all the communication lines, right? So that they can communicate with each other. And then yes. the next thing they're coming after are the resources. Because if they can cut off the resources. Then they won't be able to get themselves back together. You see what I'm saying? Yes. So resources are a part of battle. And understand when you go into warfare and intercession and deliverance and things like that, the enemy is also going to come after your finances. It's a part of war. Communications, resources. It's part of a part of the war strategy because he knows if you are a powerful prayer warrior or if you're been you've been praying you know three hours every night for however long and you've been consistent with it but then let's say he causes you to lose everything so now you can't even pay your rent now you're going to be like well i gotta go to work overtime and now you don't have time to pray you see what i'm saying yes so that your resources are a part of war. So the enemy also comes after kingdom businesses. Yes, he doesn't want the kingdom to have resources. So those are going to be the things to look out for too when you start doing deliverance. And make sure you're praying and hedge of protection around those things because those are the things the enemy's going to come after. Your prayer life is going to be the first thing because that's your communication line. Your dreams are also a communication line with the Lord. Those will be the two things he'll come after first. Because if he can get those down, then he can knock the fire out of your prayer altar. Now your covenant won't be as strong. And then he's coming after the resources next. So you don't have time to go back and pray and rebuild the fire on your prayer altar. See how it's all connected? Yes. Because now he's caused all the money to be gone. Now you got to go back to work. Now you're working 10 hours a week and you don't have time to go back and rebuild that fire on your prayer altar because you don't have time to pray because you come home tired. It's all strategic. That's the reason why he comes after the finances. As well as the communications. Those are the main three things you're going to see him come after. And that's 99% of people that are taken out. That's how it happens. That's how, Patience, you, do you, you guys remember? Mm -hmm. You mentioned three. Yeah, communication resources and what else? 
What's this? So it was a, it was the communication, mm-hmm. the resources, because mm-hmm. it was two things in communication. Because one was you, you being able to hear God, um, and so one was the the dreams, and then the other one was the prayer, like the fire on the altar. Um, so basically, the communications, the hedge of protection, and then the um, the resources. Okay, because a lot of times, have you ever seen like those movies too, where let's say you're, they're trying to break into a base, right? And they got some people up in the tower with with rifles and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Those are the ones they take out first, right? You got to take them out first because that's the hedge of protection that can see you from above. That's why they take the intercessors out first because they're high up on the wall. They can see them. They enemy coming. So a lot of times when you're doing this, you're going to see if you have a prayer team or something, the enemy will try to bring some type of strife amongst the people who are praying. The hedge of protection is another part of warfare. Because if you can mess up the prayer warriors, you can take out the ones that's on top of the wall. And now he can come on the ground and infantry. Because there's no prayer warriors on the top or on the wall to see him coming from afar. Does that make sense? Definitely. Well, this is strategic warfare 101. <laughs> I hope we're, I'm going to have to do, um, put this on YouTube because I think there's so many people that need to understand this. Um, especially since a lot of more people have been starting to do deliverance and stuff on YouTube. You know, you got a lot of people who have seen other people doing deliverance and they're like, oh, I'm going to go do deliverance. That looks cool. And then now they found themselves in places that they don't even understand what's hidden. Like Stephen. Huh? I said like Stephen did in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, when you look at, you know, stuff on YouTube, it looks easy. It's like, well, I can do that. Let me pull up a Zoom and cast some demons out. <laughs> and then they have no idea what they're really getting into. Until stuff started hitting them and they'd be like, what, what, what was that? Oh, wait, what, what, what was that? Wait, why is my finances getting hit? Well, why are all my friends turning against me? Wait, why are the people who are praying for me now cursing me? Because they don't understand the strategies. There are rules of engagement in warfare. If you don't understand them, you will be caught off guard. You will be sifted as me. If you don't understand how to go through death and come out with resurrection power, you will not survive. Patience, I, I want to share that. I am. Um, I was just like you mentioned. I was one of those people that thought, "Okay, this is good. Let's do this uh, deliverance." And as I was having a deliverance um, in Colombia with a whole bunch of women, I went to two churches and gave my testimony and um, and did a deliverance. At the same time, my husband calls me that he stepped on a pebble, a pebble, not a rock, and he fractured his ankle. And then he said, somebody's mad at you. <laughs> but it was one of those things that I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow, a pebble? A pebble, a pebble. And he fractured his ankle. Like, yeah. And, and then I thought, okay, this is no joke. Like, you, like you said, you know, it's there's a r- rules of engagement that I needed to uh, handle. <laughs> Well, that's why you guys are here in this middle of deliverance. So you can understand realistically what you're getting into. You can know realistically what we're signing up for and know exactly what to expect. Because if you understand those three things, that's that's 99%. That's the way the enemy's going to try to take you out. So the question is, how are you going to build an altar? And be guarded against those three those three things. 
first off, you need to be plugged into a prayer group. People that's praying or some type of intercessory group. Because you need to have people on the wall that can see from afar what the enemy's trying to bring. Secondly, you have to maintain your communication with God. Prayer life, dream, so that you can keep your fire burning on the altar, so that you can keep your covenant strong. Who wrote, who wrote down what I said so far? Who wrote down the three, the, three, the three things to look out for? Or were they? So just in case somebody's listening, they can be able to take notes. Who can list those three things yeah. for me? You mean to put it on the chat? Well, you can put it in the chat, but also say it. Also say it because I want to, um, because this video is going to be on YouTube, so people can go back and take notes just in case they missed it. What are the three main things that we'll need to look out for when we are engaging in spiritual warfare or doing deliverance? So I have written down they, that the enemy will try to destroy communication and your prayer life, your dreams, and just hearing the Lord. And then they'll attack your communication resources and finances. Okay, so resources are a part of your finances. And okay, what was the other thing? The hedge of protection. The hedge of protection. What, what was covered under the hedge of protection? Intercessors. People you just mentioned the, the prayer prayer yes. warriors that are behind you, right? Yep, the prayer warriors that are on the wall, the watchmen on the wall. That's what the Bible is talking about when it's popular. Talk about the watchmen on the wall. It's the prayer warriors that's on the top of the wall, and they can see from afar when the enemy's coming. You gotta have those three things in place if you're going to stand. And then, of course understanding the place for this you get that you'll be fine because every time a battle tries to take you out you will understand how to run into it and come out even stronger than you went in because you're coming out with more resurrection power than you want to do does that make sense Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Do we have a better understanding now as to why Jesus spent three days in the belly of the earth? Amen. Why did he spend all that time down there? A while, three days. Anybody know? What did he conquer when he was down there? There were three things. That's why it was three days. What were the three things? Death, hell, and the grave. Okay. Notice I've only talked about one of those so far. I've only talked about death and the place for death. What about hell and the grave? Because death is not going to be the only thing that the enemy could try to take you out with. The gates of hell is another one. That's why Jesus had to conquer all three. Death, hell, and the grave. How many of you are familiar with the gates of hell? That's the reason why the scripture says that he'll do this thing. And the, the gates of hell will not, what, prevail against you. Like, hold up, wait a minute. So does that mean that the gates of hell have the ability to prevail against you? And what are the gates of hell? Does anybody know? You can tell me what the gates of hell are. I'm really thinking, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Who 
what are the gates of hell? And how can the gates of hell prevail? Because you, first of all, think about it. Most of the time, when you think about a gate, a gate, a gate is not an offensive thing. A, a gate is more of a defensive thing, right? Isn't it? If you see gates, like a gate in front of a house, and they have a fence with a gate, usually that's like a stationary thing that's more kind of like a defense, right? Right. So how can a gate prevail against you or not? So could it be that the gates of hell is not just a stationary thing? Anybody ever thought about that? Can you repeat that, uh, patient? Someone called me when you said it. No, I'm just saying, so how could it be that the gates of hell could prevail against you? Could it be that it's not a stationary thing, like a typical gate could be? Y'all yeah, remember the scripture that says, and we'll make every crooked path straight? Can somebody pull up that text? Let's learn a little bit about the gates. Okay. You can pull up the text that talks about God making the crooked path straight. Somebody can pull that up and read it. I got it. Let me see. It is. And tell us where in the Bible it is. So somebody's listening. Isaiah, 40, Isaiah 45, verse 2. Okay. And read more than just that verse. Too. Like just... Oh, well, I'll read. Okay. So I have the screenshot because this is part of my prayer. But um, I have, I will go before thee and make the crooked place straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut and sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou may knowest that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name and the God of Israel. Okay, so stop right there. So where are the hidden riches in secret places? What is it behind based on what you just read? The gates of brass. And what, what, what are the things that he said he would cut us under? Read it again. The bars of iron and cut and sunder the bars of iron. So there's gates of brass and there's bars of iron. And what's behind them? Hidden riches. Hidden riches of secret places. Of and, secret places. Uh, and treasures of darkness. And treasures. So there's treasures and riches. Okay, so what, what the enemy, when the enemy comes after your resources, he takes them and hides them behind. Bars of iron and gates of brass. Did y'all catch that? Yes. He takes them, hides them behind gates of brass and bars of iron. And then he frustrates your life to keep you going around in cycles and cycles and cycles, making your crooked, your, your, your straight path crooked. So he does the opposite. And then God comes and says, okay, I'm going to fix all that. <laughs> Some of y'all about to understand your whole life. <laughs> I just had a dream, but um, I know you don't do dream interpretation, but I had a dream two nights ago about this. Wait, was it a, a dream about the gates? It was about the crooked paths. So I you thought I, I woke up, but um, okay, so in the dream, I was in a car. Um, I did not know who I was with, or I, I would say I didn't recognize who I was with. And at first I knew where I was going. And then all of a sudden I had like a GPS and my GPS like got, uh, it, it kind of lost signal. And I was driving and as I'm looking at the map, uh, as I'm looking at the map, it, it looked like it was like, um, like it, there was some type of like it was like miswired miswired like like the line like you know how when you're driving on a gps it has the line that's showing you where to go my lines kept going every which way like they were just going up and down and all over and i started to panic in my dream and i was like what's happening to my gps i don't know where i'm going i'm lost uh -huh. 
And I started to panic. I started freaking out. And whatever was in the car with me, they weren't of any help <laughs> that I can remember. Um, but then I started to calm down. And then I said, you know what? I'm just going to go back the way that I came because I knew where I was going when I was going the other direction. And I turned around and started going back the other way. So, but I didn't know if that was, a, I, I, well, I, to me, that was a spirit of confusion. That's not the first time I've had a spirit of confusion attacking me in my dreams, but I didn't know if God was trying to show me that I was getting back on the right path or if that was a spirit of backwardness that was also attacking me. And this happened two nights ago. So I've just been kind of, uh, and, and the last few the last few nights the dreams have been very heavy. At least you have your dreams back, which is good. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's true. I'm, I have my dreams at back because dreams at one back. point I was, yeah, I was waking up every night like, okay, I know I had a dream and I don't remember anything. So what is going on? So I have my dreams back. Um, okay. So your communication is back in place. That's good. Okay. Bonus. Okay. Okay. My my dream last night was um, I was in a I I don't know I was in a building I don't want to call it a house and there was a big window there, um that was part it was part of the dream because it was like multi part of the dream like it was a multi. You know, I have different parts of my dreams and um and there was a there was I don't know if it was the devil I know it was a devil. And um, I, I was telling him, I was like, you have no authority here. You have to leave. Mm -hmm. And he, But he was behind a glass window. And he was like, um, he's like, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. I have legal rights to be here. And I said, oh, you wow. do, yes. And he said, you, and I said, you do not have legal rights to be here. And in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I command you to leave. And he mm -hmm. started, it's, then he started to become tortured. And then I picked up this, I don't know if it was a sword. It, it was a bat. I don't know. It was a long thing. And I took it and I smashed the window. Okay. And, it, and then it came out through the window and like cut itself uh -huh. and like, and, and it was bleeding and then it would like ran away. Okay. All right. Good. I'm glad you have your communication back in place. And now you can <laughs> see that you're starting to win the battle. So you're good. For now, because I know we're about to go on a fast. So I, I know the struggle is coming. <laughs> Well, we could decree that there's not going to be much of a struggle, but okay. that will that we can destroy them even before we go in. So, but you're already winning, which is good. Okay. All right. Does everybody have their dreams? Are everybody still having their dreams, or is anybody still not remembering their dreams? I'm not remembering mine. You said you do, or you haven't been. I haven't been. How, for how long? Um, it, it's been a while, but I can't remember some of them, but most of them I can't remember. Okay. Hopefully we'll same have here. to pass. Okay. I'm the same way. And like, sometimes when I wake up, I can remember just bits and pieces and then it gets snatched. Okay. Yeah, All right. Too. So we'll, we'll deal with that in another session. Let's get back to the case. Of grass, if we have time after we'll maybe talk about that, or maybe somebody can write that down. We can talk about it for the next because once I'm finished talking about all of the strategies for warfare, then we're gonna go back through each thing, you know, like dealing with um, the hedge and all of the things that come with that, dealing with the communications, all the things that come with that. That's what we'll deal with the dreams, um, and then dealing with um, the resources. So we're gonna do those separately too in more detail. Okay, and we didn't finish. I'm curious where what are the gates of hell? And well, that's, um, that's what we're on now. So the gates. Okay. So the so one of them is what called the gates of brass. Check and see if that is anywhere else in the text besides the one that you just read. So so far we know why you're looking for that. So far we know what's hidden behind those gates. Is somebody able to share their screen and put that scripture up that she just read? For those who are watching from online. That he will break in pieces 
the gates of brass, but asunder the bars of iron. And then he'll be able to give us those treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. So there are more scriptures for the gates of brass. Uh -huh. All right. There we go. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 107, verses 15 through 21. Read that one. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Okay. That's, um, and then after it, it's full, uh, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. But, so that I'm, I, I don't know if you want me to keep going, but. So what is right after, right after it says he will cut those, um, read right after that. Keep reading beyond the verse. It, it says, uh, verse, Psalm 107, verse 16 is, for he hath broken the gates of, of brass and cut the bars of iron and sunder. Verse 17, right after that is fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Okay, stop right there. So. If we know that the treasures of darkness and hidden riches are hidden behind these gates of brass from Christians to try to keep them from getting it, it also just told us how they got there. So fools, what did it say? Fools, fools because of their transgression. Because of their transgression. So when you transgress, and there's iniquity, it gives the enemy the right to steal from you and take your treasures and put them behind a gate of brass. That's the legal right for them to take your treasures and your riches and hide them behind the gates of brass. Did y'all catch this? So most of us, before we came to Christ, all the stuff that was stolen from you when you were in the world, that's where it is. When you were in iniquity and transgression, all your stuff is sitting, hidden, all your riches, everything that God has for your life is hidden behind gates and grass. And then there's bars of iron to keep you even from getting to that. Because we were, we all were fools before. Before we knew better. And now we're trying to get it back. And it's where? Behind the gates of brass. How does God break in pieces the gates of brass? And how does he cut asunder the bars of iron? Who can guess? And then, uh, then look to us, see if there's any other scriptures about the gates of brass. See if there's any more revelation there. While you're looking for that, how do you guys think that God is able to cut asunder the bars of iron and break in pieces? I mean, break in pieces of bars of iron, cut asunder the, the break in pieces of gates of brass, cut asunder the bars of iron. How is that done? And why? Is the remedy for each one different? Why is he breaking one and cutting the other? And if you notice in the other scripture, it says it in the same order. For the gates of brass, he's always breaking it in pieces. For the bars of iron, he's always cutting it. No matter what text is in. Did y'all catch that? Why does one need to be broken and the other one needs to be cut? What are the difference between gates and bars? I think gates gates have a, a opening. You can come in and you can go out. If there's bars, because I'm thinking of it like if, if like bars on a jail cell or bars on a window, you can't 
there's no entrance. You're either in or you're out. With a gate, I feel like there's an entrance. You can either get in or you can get out through the gate. Okay, That's but typically, typically, if you are trying to get into a gate, would you break it? No, no. Tech, normally, a gate has a lock on it. Okay, normally a gate has a lock on it, but typically you're not, you're not breaking the gate into pieces, right? No. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And then for the, the bars, the bars are usually just, you know, those little long things. What do people typically use bars for? If you're behind bars, what does that mean? Jail. Inside. Aha. So bars, the bars of iron, yeah, typically is like a prison. So basically, all of your stuff is being kept hostage behind there, and then it's locked behind. After you get through the bars of iron, then it's going to go even further, and it's locked behind the gates. Brass. Any other scriptures about the gates of brass? Did you find anything else? Um, I'm looking. Okay. See if there's somebody else look and see if you can find some more scriptures on the bars of iron. Gates of brass and the bars of iron. Now that you know where your stuff is at. We didn't know how to get it. Because keep in mind, when you go into warfare, what did I tell you guys? That, what are the things that the enemy's going to afflict? Um, communication. Uh -huh. Communication, resources, yeah. and hedge of protection. Okay. So when he does that, you need to know where to go to get yourself back, right? right. Behind the gates of brass. Exactly. So that's why we're talking about this. Because we already know that's what happens. So we will be able to know exactly where to go. All right. Any other scriptures? And then we're going to talk a little bit more about why we're cutting one and breaking the other. Um, not that I can see. Okay. So breaking in pieces. The gates of brass. Anybody else think they know why God would break in pieces those gates? First of all, are the gates a, are they a stationary gate, or is it a moving gate? And is the gate alive? Because we're dealing with spiritual things. And the earth is alive. Um, oh, wait, patience, one second, sorry. Okay, so what about, I don't know if this is the same as what we're referencing, but in First Chronicles 22, verse 3, it says, and David prepared iron in abundance uh, for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings, and brass in abundance without weight. Okay, but it doesn't say what he created, what he was doing with them. Um, let me see. Building something. Let me see. Chapter. Oh, let's see. That was Chronicles 22, verse 3. Read full chapter. Let me see. After, let me see. And also, cedar trees in abundance for the uh, Zidonians. And they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. No, not really. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that. I mean, there's 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 some revelation in there, but I don't want to go into that right now. But we'll probably go into that later on. It's what, talking about the altar, like the first. Okay, so the chapter mm -hmm. starts off. Then David said, "This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel." So yeah, I believe so he was probably get ready to build the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Was it for no? Because it was well. Anyway, yeah. I don't think that one is in reference to what we're talking about. So that's fine. Okay. What are some other gates that we're familiar with besides the gates of brass? 
What are the gates to your soul? Eyes, ears, mouth. Well, the Bible says the eyes are the gates to the soul. Oh, eyes. Okay. Now you do have some other eyes. I mean, other gates. What are some of the other gates that we have besides just our eyes? I mean, this should be the easy. Ear, ear gate. Mm -hmm. the ear gate. Would that ear gate and mouth gate be also? Mouth. Oh, that eye, ear, mouth, what's some of the other gates? Any other gates? Got your nose. Your nose a gate. Yes, because um, we we could uh, I'm sure we could smell wicked smells or or you know like they can use witches and warlocks can use smells to enchant people I guess so yeah well, yeah I mean some people are able to smell certain things too like when they do deliverance like some people can smell when they're cancer on somebody but they can your your, your sense of smell can be opened up too it's very good so yeah that's a game. Okay, and then what are some of the other gates? You guys already know the sexual gates, right? Yeah, yeah, reproductive organs, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, those gates. Basically all the openings to your body. Yeah, basically. All the openings to your body are gates. So how do you guard those gates? Oh. By not cleaning. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, are they physical gates that you can see? Would we guard them by not cleaning against our body? Huh? Mm -hmm. I said, will, will we guard them um, with sin against our body? Okay. But does your eyes, do, do they look like gates? Does your nose look like gates? Like the, the idea no. of what we think a gate is? Does it look like a gate? No. No? Okay. So do you guys think the gates of hell or the gates of brass? Actually, looks like a gate. Are you saying they're gates because hell is shaped like a body? Uh -huh. Well, hell is shaped like a body. It is shaped like a body. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to let give us some perspective because if you're if your natural, like, like the gates on your body does not look like a physical gate, then we know that it's probably going to be the same thing for the gates of brass. It probably does not look like a physical gate. So, again, so this is something that we may have to do another teaching on probably at some point. Because yes, there, we still have to look at why one is cut and why one is um, broken. I'm trying to see. There was one other text that I wanted to look at. Was there another text, Tiffany, on the gates? Um, besides, let me go back. Um, no, the just the um, I did. Isaiah 45, verse 2, and Psalm 107, verse 16. Okay, what about the bars of iron? Um, let me see. And do y'all know why God breaks it into pieces? Why, um, why would you break something into a bunch of pieces? To destroy it. Okay, so it can't be put back together. Because if you just, so y'all seen like if you try to break into a gate, right? 
and let's say you cut the chain off the gate and you go into the gate. So then just put the chain back on the gate and lock it again. Put a new chain on there. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you break it, the gate into like little tiny pieces, are they going to be able to put, close it back up? No. So this is one of the things that God is doing where he says, when I break it, it's going to be broken for good. Because I'm breaking it into little pieces. And then the bars of iron, I'm cutting them asunder. What other scripture do we see the word asunder in? Okay, so do you want me to look up the... Um... Yeah, if you don't see anything for that, then just um, we'll just... You know, talk about these well, well the only the only thing I see for bars of iron is um that's additional to Psalm 107 16 and Isaiah 45 verse 2 is Job 40 Job chapter 40 verse 18 his bones are as strong pieces of brass his bones are like bars of iron okay that's good so it says his bones Yes, his bone his bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Whose bones? I'm I'm gonna pull up the full chapter. Pull um, it up. 40, pull it up. I think that's chapter. referring to I think they're referring to a beast. That's uh that's, that's something like uh that that's no no, it's not Le Leviathan, it's the beast that's similar to I think he looks something like a uh gosh, it's three of them. One of the field, one in the air, and one Ah, uh, because they described one that looked like a griffin. Yeah, that was a piece of a meal. That was a piece of an air. Okay, so yeah, read this. I think we're going somewhere here. Uh, the whole chapter or... Uh, I want to know what well, whose bones it's talking about. Um, let me see. Well, that will also disannul my judgment. Let me see. Cast by thy rage of thy wrath. Uh, look on... Um, What verse is it, Tiffany? Um, uh, verse 18. So Job chapter 40, verse 18. Because uh, right before that, it says, I'm trying to find, okay, behold now, Bamuth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Uh, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the, uh, in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river. He hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose, pier his nose pierceth through snares. I don't know if I went out. Is everyone still there? Yeah, we're still yeah. here. Okay. Yes. So I'm trying. I'm reading. I'm, re I'm reading the. Whole, right. I'm reading the whole chapter, but I don't. I'm not getting context of who he's talking about. Was it? It's an animal, but I can't remember the name of it because they took the name of it out of the text. I found it on Google. Okay. If you look up the three beasts. And one of them is is a is a griffin. Okay, good. This is good. So we need to do some research. So, if you go go further up and see if you can find any reference to which beast it is, I know it's probably one of the beasts. Is Bamuth a beast? 
or uh, uh, Bema, uh, Behemoth? Behemoth? Uh, yeah, it says, uh, because right before it, it says, uh, it says, behold now Behemoth, B-E-H-E-M-O-T-H, -E mm -hmm. which, uh, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of the stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the okay. chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. So I think it is a beast. Okay, but it's saying is he's of God, though, right? Well, yeah, it says he is the chief of the ways of God. So he is the chief mm -hmm. of the ways of, of God. What, of is he, ways. what is what does he eat? What does it say he eats? Um, it says he eat. Let me see. Uh, it oh, says he is, eat, uh, He eateth grass as an ox. Grass. Yeah, grass. Like grass, like on the ground. Yes. Okay, and then what else does he eat? It doesn't say. It just says. Um, it says he eateth grass as an ox, and his strength is in his loins. Mm -hmm. um, surely the mountains bring him forth food, where all the beasts of the field play. Okay. He. I'm trying to see if we should go that way or just yeah we'll, we'll save that one write these scriptures down too um tiffany yeah so i'm taking we, when we go back to delve into these things individually we can pull some of these up but for right now so we're talking about why does he cut in pieces the bars of iron well he breaks in pieces the case of iron well yeah and then he cuts yeah the bars of iron but it says he cuts it asunder right he cuts asunder the bars of iron. Where else do we see the word asunder? So it says the word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper oh, than yeah. any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit so more than likely what is he going to be using to cut asunder those bars of iron his word what cuts asunder the word mm -hmm. the word cuts asunder the bars of iron who knows how bars of iron come into place in somebody's life because remember bars are a place where somebody can be held prison prisoner behind right so how do we have bars come in place how does your soul get trapped in different places we talked about this y'all know this Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. When somebody goes through trauma and their soul gets shattered, what happens to each compartment of that soul? It's fragmented. Fragmented. But then what happens? It gets trapped in place where behind bars. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So when the person goes through a traumatic event, whether it was um, rape, abuse, um, the loss of parents, loved one, whatever the traumatic event is in the soul is shattered, let's say into a hundred pieces, each piece is held behind bars in a separate prison. Gain to brass. 
bars of iron. These are the bars, the bars of iron. That has to be cut. The bars of iron is what holds each fragment of the soul in a different prison. Because the goal is the enemy never wants the person and all of those fragments of their soul to come back together for them to be whole again. That's the reason why you can't prosper unless your soul prospers. Because as long as you have fragments of your soul still behind these bars of iron and they have not been reunited yet, then guess what? Your treasures of darkness and your riches will be held behind the bars of iron. So the gates of brass and the bars of iron are behind the gates of brass. The gates of brass and the bars of iron work together. The bars of iron keeps the soul separated in separate prisons so that the gates of brass can keep the, per the person's treasures and riches hidden from them. Does that make sense? So you can't prosper unless your soul prospers because unless those bars of iron are cut where the word comes in, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and cuts those gates so that the soul can be free again, then you'll never be able to see the treasures and the riches. Does that make sense? You cannot prosper unless your soul prospers. That's why the foundational part of warfare that you will see when you even go into due deliverance is the fragmentation of the soul. That's what you're going to be dealing with 99% of the time. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. It all works together. So when we look at the bars, these bars of iron, right, that keeps the person's soul trapped behind it. Why is it that it's only the word that can cut it? What do y'all think? Because, because the scripture says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you think about how sharp a knife or a sword is, Um, and 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 I think that only the word of God. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. No, I, I just want y'all to hey, just get us reason together. I just want to know what you think. It's okay. There's no right or wrong answer. What do you think? Who else has a, an idea of what they think? Why is it only the word that can cut in pieces? Well, I mean, not break in pieces, but cut asunder. Cut asunder those bars. Nobody? The word is a lot. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. She said the word is alive. Okay. That's good. Well, I'm like, is isn't like Jesus the uh, living word and the sun sets you free? So. Okay, what'd you say? Like, isn't Jesus like the living word and I don't know the word says the sun sets you free? Ooh, that's a good one. So the word king life and dwelt among us and jesus is the word okay and it says the word of god is quick and powerful drop it in any two eyes so it pierce and even to the dividing us under our soul and spirit okay that's a good one anybody else 
I think worried. because the word is like your instruction, so it'll tell you what to do. Okay. Does the word have the ability to cut something? I believe it does. Um, a lot of times, sometimes I'll hear the, you know, when I'm reading the word or if I'm listening to my Bible, I'll get convicted. So it will cut me. <laughs> Exactly. How many of you have ever been in a church? Or let's say you want to visit a church service and everything that we're saying was just like cutting you. Uh-huh. Me. And you're like, what in the world? Were they watching me this week or something? Like, what's going on here? Because <laughs> <laughs> the word of God will cut you. It's able to cut into surgery. Is able to cut into surgery. But this is the thing, guys. So many of us, and the reason why I really am just kind of slowing down here is because I really want y'all to get this. Most of the people that are going to come to you for deliverance, they have fragments of their soul that are behind bars, that are bars of iron that can only be cut by the word. And then their treasures and their riches are behind the gates. So most people have a tendency to want to go to the gates. Well, let's go ahead and break these, you know, break in pieces, the gates of brass so we can get this treasure, right? You try that all you want it. But until those bars are cut, and the soul is able to be made whole again, it's not going to be a point. Because the person won't even have their whole soul to be able to receive it. That's why both has to be done. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. To to a certain extent to me i was just i was going to ask um when you were saying that the word is the, is has the ability to cut the bars and if their soul is fragmented behind the bars and you try to give them the word in order to cut those bars to let pieces of their soul out what if they don't understand how do you give them the word to where they can understand or so that or, or to where they can receive and be set free. So are you talking about somebody who's not saved? Um, I, well, I wouldn't, I know that we've talked about saved. not doing deliverance on someone who's not saved because it wouldn't make any sense. Right back into, at that point, they're just gonna, somebody who is saved because if they're not saved, and you try to do deliverance on them and they go back right into what they're doing, it's going to turn into iniquity, right? Am I breaking up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, um, so yeah, so if somebody is saved, and you're and you're trying to cut uh, cut their and, and the word is the only thing that can and, and you're if someone is saving you're trying to do deliverance on them and the word is the only thing that can cut the bars that has pieces of their fragmented soul behind there in order to and we're trying to set them free how do we what if we're giving them the word and they and they don't and they're not understanding it but you just said they're saved. If they say everybody, everybody's that, asking. Then if, if, if they're saved, then the only thing they need to be able to understand the word is the teacher. And who's that? The comforter. Uh, the but the, but everyone doesn't receive revelation at the same time. But if you have the Holy Spirit, then you have the ability to. That's the reason why they ask the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you've gotten saved? Okay. 
So once they get saved, they need to have the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that's going to open their eyes to be able to understand the word. He's the teacher. He's the one that leads and guides into truth. So if you're dealing with somebody who is saved, but they're, they're telling you that somehow they're still not understanding the word, then they need the Holy Spirit and the infilling and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay, this is, this is a good question because these things are going to come up. So hopefully you guys are taking notes. Because if they're saved and they're still not understanding the word, then they don't have the teacher. Should the first they question, so saved. what, if, mm -hmm. saved, I guess our first question would be, are you ready to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yeah. And if and they're then, not saved, then you need to get them saved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if they are saved, the, then they need the Holy Spirit. I have had people come. I have ha ha had people say that they want to be, they want help. Like they they ask me to pray for them. Like, oh, pray for me. You know, you know, cat. You know, cat. I know that you're able to decrease certain things or speak certain things and i'm like it's not me it's the it's jesus it's the holy spirit but what if i ask them if they're saved you know sometimes they're not they're like oh i'm not ready i'm not there yet so then what do i tell them i can't pray for you because you're not saved well you can pray for somebody but you don't have a cast of demon help to pray for somebody do you Okay. You, I mean, don't y'all know how to pray for somebody without casting a demon out? Uh, yes, but I start to buy, like, um, if they tell me the problem, I try to find the of what's happening. And if I know it's a, it's an evil spirit, I start to automatically, that's my go-to. I just start binding whatever that spirit is mm -hmm. and asking God to so make that spirit a, come out of that person. in a situation like that, in a situation like that, if a person is coming, because this is the thing, there are a lot of people out there who don't want Jesus, but they're being tormented, so they just want relief from the torment. Right. But they still want to keep going back and doing yoga or whatever else it, it, it practices they're <laughs> doing, right? But they just want relief from that demon that's tormenting them. So <laughs> you're not helping them by relieving them from that, from that torment. You're not. Because if they just keep coming back to you every time they get tormented and then they're going right back into the same mess, then no, you're not even going to pray with them from that perspective anymore. You're going to pray with them that their heart is softened to receive the gospel and receive Jesus Christ. Okay. That's what you're going to pray. Okay. Um, yeah, because it's, there, there's no need to be just praying for them to that you, you're just putting up a, a a band-aid on a deep wound, which is not consoling. Okay, and that's, that's another thing too that y'all gonna come in. You're gonna have a bunch of people coming to you that don't really want. Yeah, Jayla. Yeah, Jayla was day. saying something. I was going to ask how to use the word to uh, cut in some of the bars to get pieces of your soul back. So that's the reason why when it comes to healing in the soul, a lot of times it takes a lot longer than just your typical deliverance because you're going through actually healing the different things that cause the trauma to each to bring those parts of the soul back together. So some of that stuff is going to be the word of God that will cause that bar to be broken. That's why some things you can just sit under the word and good teaching and be and get deliverance from. That's why the, that's why the scripture that says um, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. There are certain things that when you're listening to the truth, the word of truth, um, it'll there are some bars that it will cut. And the person would be is that that part of that soul will be set free. So there are some things where you just from sitting under good 
teaching and understanding um, that word of truth can call you to have difference. Just I'm sitting like that. So that's one way that the word of God is able to cut those bars. You can't, I have seen deliverance happen from somebody just being under the word being taught the word. So there is a degree of deliverance that comes from that. Because you shall indeed know the truth and the truth, the truth shall set you free in those areas. So whatever truth that you're learning and that truth begins to hit your heart, any bondage that you had in that area will begin to break. And those bars will be broken and those parts of the soul will be, will be delivered. Does that make sense? That's why you're transformed by the renewing of your mind as you listen and hear the word of God. And that truth begins to set you free. Is that how uh, God restores your soul, like it says in Psalm 23? Or is that something different? That's one of the ways, yes. So the word of God is one way. And then there are some things that you actually have to get deliverance for, though. And that's when you're talking about some of the, you know, the power demons and some of those um, the stronger ones that you won't be able to untie yourself from. But a lot of the lower level, the smaller demons, um, just the word of God alone is able to bring deliverance. That word of truth is able to set the person free in that area and cut those flowers. Have you guys, any of you ever experienced a level of deliverance just from sitting under the word? I have. Okay. Yes. I did today just reading Psalms 91, which is a psalm that I've read so many oh. times. And now all of oh, a the, sudden, especially the 23rd Psalm, people recite that all day long. They have no idea how powerful that scripture is. That, I mean, that is so powerful, guys. Like, if we, if we just went through line by line of that text, that's a whole message by itself. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to go through the valley of the shadow of death. And when they do, they're scared. But you're not supposed to fear any evil, though. Then nobody wants the rod because nobody wants to be corrected by God. Nobody really understands how to carry the staff because nobody knows how to maintain the covenant to be comforted by it. But everybody wants the next verse, though. They want the table preferred before them, right? In the presence of their enemies. They want their head anointed with oil. They want their cup to run over. They just don't want the verse before that. <laughs> but yeah, that's a powerful text. So when y'all read the 23rd Psalm again, it's going to have a whole nother meeting. But yeah. So next class, we'll probably go, um, I want to start going deeper into some of the different things that we talk about, but I still want to talk more about the gates too, but it's almost eight o'clock already um, for tonight. So hold up, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop recording so we can go into some sweet stuff. All right, let's get into the sweet stuff. <laughs> 